Okay, so now that we've seen reactions under equilibrating conditions and without any kind of selectivity between the two carbonyl compounds, we can start to think about how to actually control our aldol reactions to be between the specific nucleophile and electrophile that we want. And so the overall idea is to generate an enolate or an enolate equivalent uh, before you have any electrophile present. That way you have total control over exactly what the identity of the enolate is. And so practically speaking, that means you do a reaction, create your enolate, and then in a later step, add in with a pipette or a syringe, uh, your electrophile. So two of the most common types of enolates and enolate equivalents that you'll see are the lithium enolate, which we've seen before, and then the silyl enol ether, which we've also seen before. And here's an example. So if I take this ketone here, and I react it, and only it, with LDA at minus 78 degrees, then I will generate the lithium enolate. And that will just continue to stir there um, as long as things are cold. Once I'm happy and I feel like enough of the initial ketone has been converted to enolate, I can go ahead and then add my electrophile. And at that point, because the reaction temperature is so cold, uh, we should be pretty confident that we're only going to get this nucleophilic attack onto the electrophile. Um, I drew it all in one fell swoop here, so kind of showing all the different pieces coming together. If you have trouble tracking this, just label your nucleophilic atom and your electrophilic atom, and then fill in everything else. Um, the last piece of this is you'll see that I end up with a lithium, not a hydroxy group there, and that's because there's no protons to protonate anything yet. And so the end of all of these LDA um, enolate reactions is a uh, workup that provides that proton that's missing. And so I'm showing two different possibilities here. The first one is this aqueous workup, and that'll get you to the just the addition product. And if you have a little bit of acid in there, as we saw before, acid tends to lead to condensation. And so there's actually two different products you can get depending on what your workup is. Now that we've seen a lithium enolate example, here's one using a silyl enol ether. Um, and so I'm going to show you first the formation of a silyl enol ether, and that will typically be done taking a carbonyl compound in the presence of trimethylsilyl chloride and a weak base. And then that gets you to the new oxygen silicon bond. And this is kind of the silyl enol ether right here. Once you make a silyl enol ether, you can isolate that and work with it. Um, but in order to react it with an electrophile, you need an activated electrophile. And so what I've done here is I've shown you one where a titanium Lewis acid has coordinated to the oxygen of the carbonyl. And so this might be from um, reaction between a carbonyl and titanium tetrachloride overall. And that looks like an SN2 reaction, overall netting you this ion pair. Now that the siloenol ether has a reactive enough partner, you can do the nucleophilic attack. That's that addition to a carbonyl, an activated carbonyl in this case. And so we can put that all together. Um, again, if you're having issues kind of tracking where everything is going, just remember your nucleophilic atom is here on one end of your new bond, and the electrophilic atom is on the other end. And then from there, you can see what you need to attach. All of our titanium silicon is still here, and so what typically happens is you get this kind of regeneration of the TMS chloride by another SN2 onto silicon. So that releases the original carbonyl, and you still have this titanium hanging out right here, this neutral oxygen. What we then see is a attack of that oxygen onto silicon, again doing an SN2. Now this makes a different but still positively charged oxygen attached to silicon, and additionally generates a chloride anion uh, as a byproduct. And then that chloride anion can then go in and do an SN2 on titanium, I guess, trichloride here and eventually get back to our product in the form of a silyl ether. Okay, let's look at another example. Um, but this time we'll actually think about this in reverse. So I'm giving you a product 
that could be made through nodal condensation and asking, well, what are the two pieces that would be needed to do a nodal reaction together to get to this product? So we need a nucleophile and an electrophile. And so what you're really looking for is where that enone is right here. And in that enone, we can label the two different atoms we need to react. And looking at those and looking at previous examples of the aldol, you'll see that the green side is what the electrophilic partner needs to look like. And the blue side is what the nucleophilic partner of the reaction needs to look like. And so given that, it should be relatively straightforward to draw out what those species looks like. So the nucleophile is always easy. That just looks essentially exactly the same as what was circled. Um, the electrophile takes a little bit more work because the electrophile in the aldol reaction loses its carbonyl oxygen. Um, but we can just kind of draw on a double bond and then turn that into a carbonyl. And then remembering we have a hydrogen here and here. Now looking at the nucleophile, we have to recognize where the nucleophilic atom is. And since it's on the less hindered side, that means we need the kinetic enolate um, to do this reaction. And so if we're setting this up, we just want to choose our reaction conditions such that we can make the kinetic enolate. And so that is always just going to be LDA minus 78 degrees Celsius. And so we'll do that and then in a second step, add in the electrophile. And so I'll go through the work here of drawing in uh, the intermediate species. And it should be no surprise that this product matches the original molecule that I assigned. And so we have to do a condensation to finally get there. And because we want to do the condensation, we'll make sure to use some amount of acid in that workup. And that will ensure that the E1 reaction happens, getting us to the enone condensation product. Okay, now that we've looked at some intermolecular aldol reactions, uh, we'll do some intramolecular ones. And so these reactions are really nice because we are able to construct some uh, nice fused rings that are often very biologically relevant. And so here, I'm giving you a 10-membered ring uh, with two ketones in it. It's a very symmetric molecule. And it turns out if you take this and expose it to sodium methoxide, um, so kind of enolate generating conditions, but equilibrating conditions, then you can do an aldol reaction. So you have really one choice because of symmetry. So one enolate, one electrophile. And if it helps to number and figure out the sizes of your rings, it turns out you make a five-membered ring and a seven-membered ring. And so I will just go ahead and draw those two rings out here and then fill in where my electrophilic and nucleophilic atoms are. I know that between there and an aldol condensation, I would get the double bond. And with the rest of the numbering, I can fill in the rest of it. And so just real quick, I'll uh, show you what the product looks like with all these numbers uh, removed. Okay, next we'll look at another example, this time with a linear open chain molecule. So this is now a uh, nine carbon chain with diketone again, still symmetric. Um, if we expose it to the same sodium methoxide, um, equilibrating enolate formation conditions, we can get an aldol reaction. Um, the difference this time is now we have two options, right? We have the kinetic enolate side and the thermodynamic side. And so that means we have two different ring sizes that are possible. And I will go ahead and number through here. And what you see in the top in blue is if I react from the kinetic side, I would get an eight-membered ring. And if I react from the thermodynamic side, I would get a six-membered ring. And so an important point to remember in doing these intramolecular reactions is that five, six, and seven-member rings uh, tend to be the more stable ring sizes because there's less strain in those rings and those tend to be easier to form. And so we have a harder time forming things that are less than five or greater than seven um, in number of atoms in the ring. And so I won't draw out the entire mechanism, but just make the point that the connection between two atoms here, the nucleophile and the electrophile, must look like that. And that lets me draw the product of the aldol reaction. So I will fill in the numbering. I knew I had a six-membered ring, and I just arbitrarily put in the numbers. Um, I know that at six, I should have the electrophile. And at one, I have the nucleophile. And I'll put in the remaining groups. Just so we know what it looks like, um, I will draw the eight-membered ring product as well. So same thing, going through numbering, helping me keep track of where everything goes. Again, the nucleophile, 
electrophile and the tetrahedral intermediate at the electrophile and then the ketone doesn't change from the nucleophile. And so really what I was saying is that cyclizing from the kinetic side leads to an unstable product. And there's an important point to be made here that I haven't really made, which is that the aldol reaction itself is a reversible reaction. So you can actually imagine the reverse process happening as so, leading you back to the original diketone state. At the end of the day, we've seen this before, the elimination and the last step of the aldol reaction is not reversible. It's kind of a dead end. And so once we get to this very stable aldol condensation product, we're stuck here. And so even if any eight-membered ring formed, it would likely go back to the original open chain form, and then that could cyclize back to the six-membered ring. Awesome. That takes us through the aldol reaction. And so just to summarize, uh, the aldol reaction is a reaction where we have an enol or an enolate nucleophile reacting with some sort of carbonyl electrophile, um, either an aldehyde or a ketone. And that can go through kind of a two-step process. The first is the aldol addition, getting you to a beta hydroxy carbonyl. And the second step that could happen, and usually does happen, um, is an elimination reaction that then overall is the aldol condensation, and it generates this kind of conjugated enone structure here. So this aldol reaction is really important. It's a really great way of reacting um, two molecules together to build really complicated molecules. And we'll see lots of different versions of this going on. Turns out with subtle tweaks to this aldol reaction, you can get other types of reactivity. And so that's what we'll look at when we look at Claisen condensations and Michael additions and some of their derivative reactions.